So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Nandini Ramesh. Nandini has accepted a position as a postdoctoral researcher in DARE, and we're very much looking forward to her physical presence sometime early next year. Currently, Nandini is in the Department of Earth and Plenary Sciences at UC Berkeley, and her research focuses on decadal climate variability and the role of ocean in climate in the tropics, which is very relevant, of course, for Australia. She received her PhD from Columbia University and a master's in earth physics from, the, from ANU and a bachelor in science from University of Madras. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Nandini. Um, if everybody could write, if you have questions, could you put them in the chat and then we'll field questions at the end of Nandini's talk. All right, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm currently based at UC Berkeley, but we'll be moving over to join DARE in January. Um, and the work I'm going to present today was partly done here as part of my postdoc and partly done at Columbia University where I got my PhD. It was funded variously by NASA and the US NSF and the US Department of Energy. For today's talk, I've chosen three projects that I've worked on in the general area of tropical climate prediction. Um, I've picked these three different projects with the objective of sort of showcasing three very different methodologies for arriving at scientific results. And um, in doing that, I, uh, I will probably just give you an overview of, uh, that's focused on the methodologies rather than giving you the actual um, implications of the results in great detail. But if you are interested in any of these results, I'm more than happy to talk about it. So I will um, be happy to take questions on that at the end. So the tropics are a really interesting place. Um, for societal reasons, they're interesting because many people live there, over 2 billion. Um, this is a map of the Earth's population density with darker colors showing the um, more densely populated locations. And if you look at the tropical belt, there's really a lot of very densely populated places here. So the climate of the tropics obviously affects all of them, but it also affects the rest of us outside the tropics um, because what happens in the tropics doesn't stay in the tropics. Uh, the climate of the tropics produces phenomena that have propagating effects, ending up um, all the way out over Europe or Alaska, and has even shown effects on things like Antarctic sea ice melt. From a more fundamental science point of view, the tropics are interesting as a fluid dynamical setting. Um, one of the unique things about it is that it has a low Coriolis parameter, meaning that the effects of the Earth's rotation are small but present. And that sort of changes the set of assumptions we need to make uh, about the fluid dynamics of the region. Um, the ocean in this area is highly stratified. And what I mean by that is uh, what you see here in this picture, that is the upper ocean is quite warm and the lower ocean is quite cool. And the gradient between those is very sharp. What this results in is um, two layers of fluid of different densities because the warmer fluid is less dense, um, behaving almost as if they are um, not coupled to each other. They're just sitting on top of each other. And that's a pretty unusual fluid dynamical setting. Um, the third unusual thing about the tropics is that the atmosphere is really warm and holds a lot of moisture. And this intensifies the convective activity in the tropics and allows for um, the sort of torrential downpours associated with monsoons or um, the massive um, wind speeds and um, rotational motion associated with um, tropical cyclones. An important tool that we use in studying climate in general is um, climate models or general circulation models. These are um, based on uh, multivariate partial differential equations. So they're based on things like the equations of motion, the conservation of mass, 
um, the conservation of energy and um, various uh, equations that tell us about the physical state. These equations need to be discretized and solved on an X, Y, Z grid that evolves through time. This is a pretty computationally intensive activity and um, there are many research groups all over the world that develop and uh, maintain these climate models for other people to use. Um, they're used by the UN IPCC in order to um, simulate what will happen under climate change. That's where we get our projections of what a two degree warmer world would look like, for example. Um, but they're also used in order to test hypotheses that we might have about the way the Earth system works. So um, you can test some pretty crazy things using these simulations. For example, you could um, smooth out the whole planet and see what happens to the climate if there are no mountains. Or if you change the shape of the continents, what would, do, would that do to ocean circulation? So these are a very useful tool. Um, so before I tell you about the tropical climate in particular, I have to address the elephant in the room, which is El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's the single biggest climate signal that comes out of the tropics and arguably on the planet um, and results in these El Nino events and La Nina events, which I'm sure everyone has already heard a little bit about. Um, so the baseline for these is the normal state of the tropical Pacific. So what you see here is a map with the Americas over on this side and a very distorted Australia on this side with um, the surface temperatures of the ocean shown in the colors here. So over here by the western end of the Pacific, you have very warm temperatures and that warms the air above it and drives um, convection above that region. On the eastern side, you have winds blowing from east to west and that causes divergence of the surface water. Now when the surface water diverges, something has to rush to fill its place, so you get upwelling from below. And because you have much cooler water below, that immediately cools the surface temperature in the east. So you have this very strong gradient of temperatures across the Pacific, and that further intensifies those winds that blow from east to west by reducing the pressure on this side and increasing the pressure on this side, just through changing the temperature of the air. During an El Nino event, what happens is that this whole region in the east and central tropical Pacific gets significantly warmer than it would otherwise be, um, causing convection to shift over into the central Pacific region. And during a La Nina event, you get colder than usual anomalies in that area, and that shifts the convection in the opposite direction. Now, the situation I've just described to you is clearly a feedback loop, a feedback loop that reinforces itself. Um, and that's how you go from having normal conditions to an El Nino or a La Nina. So for example, if you got, for some reason, an abnormally warm temperature in this part of the tropical Pacific, you would weaken the gradient of temperature and therefore pressure across the Pacific. That would weaken the strength of this trade wind system. That would reduce the upwelling here that brings cool water to the surface and that would further reinforce your warm anomaly. So that's how you get from here to here um, by pushing the feedback in this direction. You can also push the feedback in the opposite direction where you get a cooler than normal um, set of conditions here, a stronger temperature gradient across the Pacific, enhance the trade winds and increase the upwelling further bringing more cool water to the surface. Um, so this is a pretty unstable, nonlinear system, which makes it really fascinating um, and is quite central to the Earth's climate. We get these oscillations between these states on a timescale of about um, two to seven years. 
And the really anomalous parts of those conditions last about two to four seasons, depending. Now, the main way in which El Ninos and La Ninas have effects on the rest of the world is by shifting that center of convection. That then sets off a set of waves in the upper atmosphere, which perturbs the climate in various parts of the world. Um, so on the left here, you can see just for one season of the year, what happens if you have an El Nino event, and on the right, what happens if you have a La Nina event. And the effects go out as far as Alaska or Southern Africa, and there's really no um, escaping an El Nino event. Fortunately for us, we're quite good at forecasting this now. It's been an effort uh, that's lasted us several decades. And um, we're able to now forecast it a couple of seasons in advance. What I'm showing you here is um, the most recent prediction from the IRI, which is an organization at Columbia University, which uh, issues these forecasts. And um, what they show here is um, the model state where they have submitted, they've um, initialized the model using the observed state of the ocean and atmosphere. Um, and these are various models from around the world, which have projected what they expect to happen. Um, the lines with the circles are not the GCMs based on PDEs that I told you about, but instead they are statistical models, which also make pretty similar pre predictions of what's going to happen. Um, so all of these are predicting that um, the sea surface temperature anom anomaly is going to be negative in the East Pacific, meaning that we're going into a La Nina, and that does seem to indeed be what's happening right now in the world. On longer time scales, we also have an oscillation between um, low variance cool states in that part of the world and high variance warm states um, that last for about 30 years each. Um, we don't really have a good sense of why this happens. Um, and uh, we know that it has similar impacts to El Nino and La Nina events, and it has been measured in different ways. But some people argue that this is just noise and it's just because sometimes you occasionally have a decade with more La Ninas. Uh, but some people have put uh, pretty detailed hypotheses forward for physical mechanisms that can generate variability on this time scale. But right now, the answer is that we don't really know why this happens. Um, so for the first project that I'm going to tell you about, um, I'm going to address a phenomenon that happens sort of at the intermediate time scale between the El Nino and La Nina event time scale to and uh, the decadal time scale. So an example of the kind of event I'm interested in here is shown in this map. Um, what I've got on the ocean shows a cool anomaly in the tropical Pacific. These are temperatures. And on the land, I'm showing you precipitation. So this was um, the 1930s, which was the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl drought in the US. That's what you see here in the Midwestern US. And many other parts of the world were suffering from protracted droughts at the same time. So obviously Australia was going through a lot and there's um, several parts of South America that were affected, Southern India, East Africa. Um, and this had major consequences for all these places. So I'm showing you on the right a few instances of this that have happened in the historical record identified in this paper, um, which all um, caused events that were large enough that they were recorded in history as being catastrophic in some way. So in order to study this particular type of event, we used two types of climate models. The first is a GCM, um, which is one of the standard GCMs used by the IPCC and so on. 
um, we were able to get a simulation of 4,000 years um, from that model from the people at Princeton that developed it. And the second model that we use is the zbiak kane model, which is um, a much simpler model that's designed to only simulate the tropical Pacific region. It's, um, even though it's quite simplified, it's been effectively used in predicting El Nino and La Nina events in the past and has been one of the first models to successfully do that. Um, and the nice thing about it is that it's extremely computationally light because it's not simulating the whole global ocean. Um, so I was able to run it for a simulation of 100,000 years in just a matter of two days on a desktop computer. Um, so we have a great deal of data from that as well. Um, what we did first was to take the sea surface temperature anomaly averaged over this Nino 3 dark gray box, which is a frequently used indicator of ENSO activity, um, and correlate the periods that we're interested in with every possible segment of the model simulations. So here the black line in these graphs shows the observed anomaly in these periods. So we had one that started in 1870, 1890, 1932, and 1948. And the blue line shows the best analog that we were able to find in the model. And the analog is measured by just what was the highest correlation coefficient we were able to get for any signal, sorry, for any segment in this model. Um, and we did a similar thing for the zbiak kane model. So here the green line shows an example from each of those events. We found that the zbiak kane model, despite its, increase, despite its decreased complexity, was able to capture it at least as well as um, the more computationally intensive model. So we stuck with the zbiak kane model to be able to get um, just a larger sample size to work with. So the question that we wanted to ask was, are these states predictable in advance? What I mean by that is, if they are predictable, then there must be enough information at the beginning of that state to tell me that the state is about to persist for seven years or so. Um, whereas if it's driven entirely by stochastic processes or random noise, I won't have that information at the beginning of the state. Um, so in order to test whether or not that's the case, we took our four events and for each one, we picked the top 20 analogs from the model based on their correlation coefficient. And we ran an ensemble of 100 perturbed runs for each. So we got a total of 8,000 runs of the zbiak kane model. What we did um, for these ensembles was to initiate the experiment six months before the start of a cool event. And um, at that model state six months ahead, we added a small perturbation at each grid point to the sea surface temperature. So um, this was a randomly sampled um, value with um, a range of minus uh, sigma over five to plus sigma over five, where sigma was the standard deviation of, of the sea surface temperature. So the idea here is to capture something randomized that is of a small enough magnitude that it could be either measurement error or weather noise. And if the system is really so sensitive to feedbacks, um, you can imagine like a butterfly effect, uh, then we should expect the uh, ensemble members to all diverge rapidly and give us um, pretty poor predictions of the future. Um, but if these perturbations don't do that, then maybe there's some hope for predicting this phenomenon. So these are some of our results. Uh, what's shown in the graph here is the root mean squared error um, over the course of our ensemble run. The dark red line is the uh, median and the um, dashed lines show the upper and lower quartiles. So on the 
x axis you have time and you can see that the rmsd degrade, degrades really rapidly or rather increases really rapidly the scale degrades really rapidly um, and an anomaly of about one degree c is quite large in this system so you're above one degree c within a few years you can't really predict well beyond two years and this is pretty consistent with what we know about El Nino events. We're able to predict them maybe two, at most three seasons in advance, and they last for two to four seasons. So beyond about two years, we don't really have the ability to predict this system. Um, however, what this is measuring is how good it is at capturing the individual ups and downs of that time series. But for this particular problem, what we're interested in for applications is really just, is the mean cool or not? And so we can sort of lower our standards for this prediction. We don't really need to know the ups and downs. Is it cool or not on average? Um, and when we do that, we find that we're actually able to predict the cool mean state over several years. Uh, what I have here is the result for each of our four um, events with um, on the x-axis again we have time we're starting about four years into the simulation here so if you um, at each point along these lines I've averaged the time series starting at 1870 to 1874 or 1870 to 1876 and so on and the blue line here shows the median prediction across the ensemble. Um, the ensemble quite consistently predicts a negative mean anomaly in um, 1870, 1870 and 1890. Um, it does fairly well in 1932 and it completely fails in 48. So we found that um, in three or four cases, there is actually enough information there to predict the mean state going forward several years. So to summarize that project, we first went into a climate model and selected analogs to a climate state that we were interested in. We then added a small randomized perturbation at the beginning of um, that state and simulated it again. Even with the perturbation added, we were able to predict a long-term statistic about the model state, even though we were not able to predict the exact trajectory. The next project that I'd like to tell you a bit about is um, more to do with the longer time scale, but relies on some of these results. Um, and before I get into it, I'd like to give you a little background on chaotic systems and how we like to think about them. So what I've got here in this picture is the Lorenz attractor. That's the attractor of the Lorenz system, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. It's the first chaotic system that was seriously studied. It's, um, it has three variables, X, Y, and Z. And what's plotted here is the evolution of X, Y, and Z in the system through time. This um, shape that you get by doing that is the attractor and it encompasses all the possible states that the system can take. One nice thing that you can learn from looking at the attractor is when you have very separate regimes of behavior. So for example, here you have two different lobes and in one X and Z are positively correlated and the other X and Z are negatively correlated, which is not something you can get from, for example, a a PDF or scatter plot. Another thing that the attractor is really useful for is to figure out whether or not you're in a predictable state. So if you are in the middle of the attractor here, if you're on one of these trajectories and there's a very small perturbation uh, or you measure your location a little inaccurately, you could either go off into the left lobe or into the right lobe right lobe. It's not very easy to predict that. Um, if you're upper, up here in this lobe, uh, 
it's much easier to predict where you're going to go because all the trajectories in that part of the tractor go in the same direction. So I can say, well, in the next time step, I can be pretty confident that I will go the same way that my neighbors are going. Now, the problem in figuring out how to make the attractor for the system we're interested in here is that we don't know the physics. We don't understand why this decadal oscillation shows up. And um, it's not easy to figure out which variables are most relevant to it. If you think about the model state, um, it's a very high dimensional thing. So there's uh, at each grid point, there's a temperature, there's a velocity, there's a humidity, um, all of these things at different levels. Um, so that's a very high dimensional um, variable, but it's highly redundant because all of these things are very far from independent. They're closely coupled. Um, so we need to figure out how to pull out just the relevant ones for us. In our field, it's quite common to use things like EOFs or self-organizing maps in order to pull out modes of variability. But the thing with those is that they don't actually preserve your, um, your predictability characteristics. They just preserve the, um, the best covariance matrix that you can get. So instead, we um, use an approach that's specifically designed for chaotic systems uh, based on work by George Sujihara at UC San Diego. This method applies Dawkins embedding theorem, which states that for a given attractor, there exists a shadow manifold, which can be reconstructed by just using the information in a single time series from your coupled system. And this shadow manifold should preserve the topology of your original attractor. Instead of having X, Y, and Z as the axes in your space, what you do in a shadow manifold is you have one of these variables here, they're showing Y, um, lagged against itself. So you can see the axes are y, y of t minus tau, y of t minus 2 tau, and for whatever number of dimensions your system has, you can, um, you can go up to n minus 1 tau. So this is very nice, but we don't yet know what n and tau are for our system. Um, so we use the simplex projection method that was developed for this. Um, the first thing we need to do is select an index. So again, we're going to use this, um, the average sea surface temperature anomaly in this box. Um, we then make a version of the shadow manifold using n dimensions and a lag of tau months for every possible n tau pair within a reasonable range. And the next um, step is to use the nearest neighbors of some randomly chosen points um, in order to assess predictability. The way that you do this is you choose the nearest neighbors of your point, you project them forward in time, look at the average of um, all their locations at the next time step, and that is your prediction. You score your prediction based on how well, um, how close that is to where your point actually goes. Um, you then do this over and over again, over several points, and you select the pair of n and tau that produces the best prediction. In our case, we're not just interested in the one step forward future, we're interested in a long-term statistic, which we learned is more predictable than the next step um, from the previous project. So we use the 15-year standard deviation. Um, just remember that the Pacific decadal variability um, goes between high variance and low variance states in the tropical Pacific. Um, and we reconstruct the attractor using that. So I'm going to show you an animation of what we got by doing that for the zbiak kane model. And this is the system evolving through time. It's three-dimensional. 
uh, we found that the optimal lag was six months. So you can see the axes here are zero, six months, and 12 months. And the system traces out these loops or orbits in the state space. So it makes this large orbit and then switches to a smaller orbit and it's going to switch back to the large orbit again. Um, now you can think of these orbits as being uh, related to the standard deviation of the series. Um, just think of how far they are from the center being similar of, to how much they deviate from the mean. Um, so to verify that there really are two regimes, there really are two orbits in this very long time series, uh, I'm showing you here the histogram of 15 year standard deviations um, over every 15 year segment of my 100,000 year time series. And you get a very clear separation of two peaks. Um, you can also do this with the mean, but your peaks don't separate as well. So the real thing that seems to be setting apart the two regimes is the standard deviation. Um, we also found that the system switches between these high and low standard deviation states approximately every 30 years. And that matches very well with what we've seen in the observations of this phenomenon. That is approximately the time scale we should expect. So now that we have this shadow manifold, um, we can use it to learn things about the predictability of the system. Um, the way we do this is to divide the space into cubes, basically on a grid um, of 0.1 degrees C. And for each grid box, we assess the trajectories that go through it and take a majority vote of which ones go into the low standard deviation state and which ones go into a high standard deviation state. Um, so in this example, there's two versus one. So I'm getting a negative prediction with a confidence of 66.67%. Um, and we did this um, for every cube in the space. And here I have highlighted for you just the ones that had 85% or more confidence in their predictions. The blue ones predict a low variance or cool state, and the yellow ones predict a high variance or a warm state. So that tells us that the system actually does spend a fair bit of time in predictable states. And there is some hope for making predictions from those states of this long-term phenomenon. Um, just as a sanity check, um, I'm showing you on the left uh, that, or let me back up. Um, in that cluster, we uh, have the time indices of the time series that occur during these high predictable, highly predictable states, right? So um, we go into the model state and look at the maps of what is happening in the physical variables in the model during that time. So on the left here, what I'm showing you is the standard deviation at each spatial point averaged over this blue cluster divided by the standard deviation over the full 100,000 year time series. Now, if my attractor reconstruction has worked and I'm actually characterizing a specific physical state with specific characteristics, this standard deviation ratio should be quite low. It should be less than one. And um, we find that that is the case. In most places, it is less than 0.3. On the right, I'm showing you what the average state looks like. So here you can see there's a cool anomaly in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, a very slight cool anomaly. Um, when we look at the thermocline depth, it's deeper on the Western side of the Pacific. And there's a specific pattern of um, wind speeds that's associated with um, this particular state. So to summarize what we did here, we reconstructed the shadow manifold of the climate model that we used. That allowed us to identify two regimes of behavior that correspond to interdecadal variability that we're interested in. 
we located the states from which predict predictions of that phenomenon can reliably be made. And we've begun now to characterize physically what is happening in the model um, during those states. And right now, uh, one thing that I'm working on is using decision tree um, based classifiers to, um, to really narrow down which characteristics of those states are important. Now, moving on to my third project, that's uh, it's on a little bit of a different topic, which is um, rainfall, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, in this project, we are going to use um, sort of more conventional physical reasoning in order to reach a conclusion on what physical processes are important for a particular phenomenon. Now this map is showing you something very simple and basic. Um, it's just the fraction of the annual rainfall in an average year that occurs at each point during September to February in the Northern Hemisphere. So that is autumn and winter and March to August in the Southern Hemisphere. The most obvious thing that stands out here is that most of the map is blue. That means most of the map receives its rainfall at um, times of year that are in spring and summer. And that's consistent with what we expect. Um, the tropical land regions usually receive rainfall due to a summer monsoon. And that's what we're seeing. However, there are all these exceptions and they're not very well understood. Um, the ones that I find interesting and I'm going to pursue here are the ones along Eastern coastlines. So I've highlighted um, eight of them around the world. And uh, you can see they all line up quite nicely along the coastline. And when you just look at only the orange parts of these eight regions, there are 280 million people that live within them. Um, so the people here are really quite underserved in terms of both our um, ability to forecast their weather and our ability to say what's going to happen under climate change to these places. Now, one thing that all these places have in common is that the rainfall peaks in autumn. Um, so the upper panel here shows what's uh, the average seasonal cycle in the Northern Hemisphere and the lower shows that in the Southern Hemisphere. So all of them in the Northern Hemisphere peak between October and December, so late autumn, early winter. And um, similarly in the Southern Hemisphere, it's in March or April. So our first hypothesis for why we get this type of rainfall um, was that it's orographic. Um, just as a quick primer, there's, here's a little diagram of what orographic rainfall is. As the winds come in towards a mountain range, they carry moisture, but they're forced to rise, meaning that the air is forced to cool and that causes condensation and cloud formation and rainfall on the windward side of the mountain. And as the air loses its moisture and passes over the mountain, it then becomes very dry and you don't get rainfall on the other side. Um, and this is relevant to our regions because during the, re during the seasons of rainfall, so October to December in the Northern Hemisphere, April to June in the Southern Hemisphere, um, the winds are coming from the east onto the coast. And many of these places line up with mountain ranges. So we thought this is a good hypothesis for um, why rainfall occurs in these places at this time of year. Um, we used a simple scaling in order to assess that hypothesis. Um, here, the things that go into the scaling are the density of the surface air, the humidity of the air, and the projection of the wind vector onto the direction of the slope of the land. Now, what we found when we did this for every month of the year was that it predicts some amount of rainfall, but it doesn't predict a peak in autumn, which is the really unusual thing that we were trying to explain. 
um, the timing of the peak was quite off in many of these places when we just used this scaling. So something else has to be going on. In order to assess that, we used um, what's called a moisture budget. And um, for those of you that are earth scientists, budgets are obviously very familiar to you. Um, but basically what we're doing here is assessing um, what comes in and what goes out of a column of air. Um, in the tropical atmosphere, the uh, water vapor isn't really retained for long time scales, like a month. So we can assume what goes in has to go out. Um, in this diagram, what I'm showing you is the various terms in this equation. So the precipitation has to go out. The evaporation is bringing water vapor in. Um, so that's on your left hand side. Those are the vertical terms. And for a column of air over your region, the um, vertical integral of the moisture flux, which is the velocity coming in times the amount of moisture that's contained into it, tells you whether you're getting a net gain or loss of moisture. Um, I should also point out that we use pressure coordinates here. So P equals zero is at the top, and P equals PS is the surface pressure, which is usually around 1,000 hectopascals. Um, so using some vector calculus identities and algebra, you can rearrange that equation to get this. And let's not focus on the constants or the integrals there, but just what these physically mean. The first of these terms represents convergence. That's what this div u is doing here. Um, and what you can get out of looking at that term is whether or not the wind field is converging or diverging moisture into your region. The second term is the advection term, um, which tells you whether a wind field is bringing wetter air from somewhere else or whether you're downstream of a dry air, drier area and you're getting dry air from somewhere else. The third term is a residual surface term that comes from that vertical integration and in pressure coordinates. Um, and it's very closely related to the orography because it has to do with the flow along the surface. So for each of our eight regions, we um, broke down the moisture budget into these terms. And um, on the x-axis here, you have the seasons, uh, sorry, the months. So that's January, February, and so on. Um, and the blue line shows P minus E or the vertical or what's known as the VIMC. And we found that evaporation doesn't really change over the course of the year. So by predicting the VIMC, you're really predicting the rainfall. In all of these places, we found that the peak um, VIMC occurs with the peak convergence. So convergence really seems to be the driving factor here. That means that um, the dominant term is that div u that we saw in the previous equation. And because we have to conserve mass in the atmosphere, we, when we have convergent uh, moist air, it has to go in the vertical. So that means that you're convecting. And um, we found that when we looked at vertical mass flux in these regions, that was consistent. So um, what I'm showing you here, again, we have time on the x-axis, but this time we have pressure coordinates on the y-axis. So the surface is at about 1,000 hectopascals. The top of the atmosphere is at zero. The warm colors show where the mass flux is upward, meaning that you have ascent and that drives a lot of convection. Um, and the blue colors show downward mass flux and that's usually associated with drying in the atmosphere. So we were able to confirm then that um, convection was what uh, was important for the rainfall in autumn at these places. And we can then go from there and um, think about the factors that make um, a location favorable for convection. So that can have um, 
that can be influenced by the surface temperatures or surface moisture. It can also be influenced by large scale factors that set the atmospheric stability. So to summarize what we did there, we um, identified a pattern of rainfall we were interested in that hasn't been studied before. Um, we used a simple scaling, which ruled out orographic effects as the leading order term. We then used a moisture budget to show which variables must be relevant to this rainfall. And currently I'm now working on um, predicting the amount and timing of rainfall in these regions under climate change. So looking at how those factors that we identified as important are going to change in the future. So just to wrap up, um, I've now shown you um, three projects that I've worked on in the area of tropical climate. In the first one, we used a perturbed ensemble of climate model simulations, which um, let us assess the predictability of a long-term statistic. In the second one, we used an attractor reconstruction method that let us identify regimes of behavior on the time scale of interest and um, also identify the states of the system in physical terms from which predictions can reliably be made. And in the third um, project, we used a discretized set of partial differential equations um, based on our physical reasoning in order to deduce which processes were most important for um, the rainfall that we were interested in. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, thanks again for having me.